Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the most recent Why and How webinar. It's been a while since we've had any, any of these. Uh, my name's Avery and my co-host Ina is also with us today. Um, today we have two speakers that will be giving us lectures on molecular imaging uh, and in particular how we actually develop molecular probes for imaging. Uh, first, uh, we're going to have a discussion on PET uh, probe development and then on MRI probe development. Uh, so first we have Professor Chang Ying Wang, who's faculty here at MGH, or Martino Center, and he'll be giving us this first part on uh, PET imaging, uh, PET probe development. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, I will first people today to talk about uh, uh, PET imaging probe development. So, uh, okay, Let's see. Okay. So, first of all, I say uh, I have two parts today. One, the first part is talk about uh, PET imaging, and the second part is an example of the uh, PET imaging probe for HDAC. We call the Martino stat. I think uh, some people already know that this is a uh, new PET imaging tracer from uh, our Martinos, and uh, this is also my work during my postdoc research. And uh, I will show more details on how we find this probe and uh, uh, how we use this probe in the future. So uh, first of all, why we focus on the uh, positron emission tomography? Uh, here is a figure from a review like more than 10 years ago. It summarized all the uh, imaging modalities from 1900 to 2008. There are two parts. One is like top part is for clinical use from X-ray, CT, then uh, PET, PET CT, MRI. And the down row is like for optical, you know, most time for preclinical imaging. Among all the imaging uh, modalities, uh, PET is kind of a uh, special one, can direct uh, introduce like uh, radioisotopes to the small molecules or peptide uh, and can do imaging with PET. Uh, because we use this one for in vivo imaging and use only tracer amount, so it's easy to translate the imaging probe from animal study to human study. So that's one advantage of this uh, PET imaging technique. So here, for PET imaging, we have to use a uh, imaging probe, or we call the uh, radio tracer or radio ligand. Before we do any scan, we need to uh, inject such imaging probe to the animal or humans. Uh, this can be used for in vivo protein expression or function no study. Uh, a quick uh, summary of this uh, pro, uh, production of the PET imaging is like we start from the isotope you know, production from the cyclotron. Uh, we have one cyclotron in our 149 building on the first floor. We can generate some radioisotopes, for example, C11, uh, F18, and 13, and O15. They have different half-lives. Uh, most commonly used two isotopes, uh, CAV11 and uh, F18, for 20 minutes and uh, about one 10 minutes half lives. Uh, we have to make this uh, tracer on site with some like we call automation box, you know, a simple chemical reactions and purification and formulation. And then we have some QC procedure. And this pre, uh, procedure take like 40 to 60 minutes. It's about like uh, one to, uh, two to three half lives for C11 and about like half, half life to uh, F18. After this, we release a dose we can inject to the human, for example, in B6 or B7 uh, for the imaging and the further analysis. So everything we do here is very fast to generate any radioisotopes for human study. So regarding the uh, PET imaging probes, we have basically two families. One is a receptor or ligand based. For example, the Recopride 
is a CE11 tracer for a dopamine receptor imaging. Uh, this kind of tracer is for measured expression of a target. Uh, another one is F18 FDG, which is used for enzyme uh, called enzyme or substrate based imaging probe. For example, FDG is for glucose metabolism, it's for functional, uh, functional measurement. Uh, but most of the current PET imaging probes are, folks are, are, are based on this receptor or ligand based family. So most of them we use for uh, the expression measurement. So here is a quick table to summarize some FDA approved drugs. The protein classes and the number of genes. There are hundred, hundreds of targets here you know, for the uh, for the drugs, but for the human uh, for the PET imaging, it's relatively low number here. Uh, from the NIMH summarized a table for the CNS real tracer table, they list like about like thirty seven targets around more than a hundred molecules here can be used in human. So that's a lot of target still need a PET imaging probe, either in cap 11 or F18 or LD123 or other uh, isotopes. So our job is like to find new tracers. And personally, my focus is for um, brain imaging. So I focus on the uh, PET imaging probes for uh, brain research. <laughs> and uh, among all these PET imaging probes can be used in human, there are only like a 12 FDA approved PET radio tracers. So the first one is the most famous one, F18 FDG, we use in our center every day for multiple scans. It can be used for the tumor or cardiology or in brains for many applications. And some other tracers like uh, carbon 11, choline, or some other tracers for uh, prostate cancer. Uh, uh, FDA approved some F18 labeled for uh, A beta plaques, uh, very similar structures um, based on Pittsburgh compound B, and some uh, gallium 68 you know, tracers for some tumor imaging, and for the uh, some other isotopes for bone imaging or some like uh, other disease. The last one is uh, F18 labeled Aerodoba, which is uh, the most recent approved one. It's, uh, I think it's approved last uh, September or October. So totally it's 12. So the many tracers already in human, but we still cannot push, uh, go through the FDA approved. <clears throat> it's a long way to go. So how we find a PET imaging probe a new probe. So I will take the example of the HDAX. So uh, how we find this HDAX probe, Martinostat. So first of all, we need a team you know, to, to uh, complete this project from the probe design, chemistry, including the radio chemistry, and the preclinical imaging, translational imaging, and human imaging. So that's, uh, we all have such expertise in our materials, so we can work together and find such probes. And the HDAC is a kind of uh, epigenetic target. Now, epigenetic is, uh, is a, a process that didn't change the uh, gene sequence, but only modify the, the histone tails or DNA methylation. It's related to many kind of disorders, from cancer to uh, uh, brain disorders or heart disorders. So this is our goal to image HDAC. This is uh, a slide I prepared when I joined Martino Center, like uh, 2012. No, at that time, we don't have any probes. So that's my job. And uh, this is overall timeline for the Martino stat. We start from uh, 2007, when my uh, postdoc PI, Dr. Jacob Hooker, started his postdoc at Brook Heaven. He started this project. And after he moved to Martinez and uh, found me at 2012, I continued this work. 
and uh, we uh, start from the lead compound identification from the literatures or, or patterns, uh, find thousands of compounds, and we find someone with good binding and uh, S50 or EC50. Then we choose some compound for video labeling. First of all, we modified structures can be labeled with C11 or F18. Actually, we labeled uh, hundreds of compounds here. Uh, after video labeling, we test in animals because we focus on the brain imaging. So first of all, we take uh, we measure the brain uptake and some like uh, uh, PK or bio D data. Also, the spatial binding is very important for the um, imaging probes, pet imaging probes. Also, we need to measure the toxicity for the probes if we want to use in the human. So in 2014, actually, we have this IND approved by FDA, and the next month, uh, IRB approved our protocol and for uh, our human imaging research. So if we go for the detailed pipelines, there are some like a lead compound, radiochemistry, so small animal, uh, the big animal, like non-human primates, then we go to the uh, human. So uh, radiochemistry is, a, 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 is an important technique we need, for example, from the lead compound. We need to label it with uh, radioisotopes with high radiochemical yield or specific activity. So we always want to try to develop new methods for the radio labeling. For, for some examples here, like uh, CAM-11 or F18 labeled, uh, use different methods, not the traditional uh, method. So we can use different uh, structure and uh, uh, different catalysts to label these molecules. So after the labeling, we need a test in the animals with uh, specific activity, uh, specific binding or brain uptake test first. For example, if we, we inject an animal with a baseline, we call, we call it baseline because we inject the trace only. The pre-treatment we use like uh, same target drug, uh, we can use the unlabeled uh, parent drug or some known drugs for the same target. Now, if we pre-treat such drugs, and then we see the decrease of the PET signal in the brain, that means the specific binding may be high or good enough. Another way to test the specific binding is use disease models, which know, we know that the target or the protein, the receptors, are expressed high or low in certain models. Then if we can see the difference, and match the in vivo data and the in ex vivo data. That means the specific binding of the probe is good. Uh, for chemistry, we start with uh, known H type inhibitors. There are four kinds of big families for reported H type inhibitors, like short chain fatty acids or hydroxymic acids or benzamide or some big molecules, including the peptides or nitro products or some ketones. But we know that uh, these big structures may not have very good brain penetration. So we didn't test these kind of families. So we start with the fatty acid first. This work, work are done from the blue heaven. So we labeled some like simple molecules with C11 test in the animals. But mo uh, all the three molecules didn't show the brain uptake. There's only some like body uptake. So the uh, brain TAC is pretty low here. The percentage adipose C is like a kind of measurement unit of the brain uptake. So normally a good tracer in mice, will, this value will be like 0.3 or more. So here you see this number is 0 0.004 or 0 0.06 is pretty low. So next one, we try to label another family called benzamides because we have the benzamide structure for the zinc binding. 
Uh, MS75 is the HDAC inhibitor. Uh, went to clinical trial, but they stopped at phase two. Uh, in the literature, they reported that this is a brain penetrant compound. Then we label it with C11 and test in uh, rats and in the non-human primates. Both species didn't show us the good uptake of the tracer in the brain. Mm, so that tell us if a trace is a compound used for drugs, they may have some like brain penetration. For example, the brain to plus ratio may be 0.1 or 0.2. That's enough for a brain drug. But for our pet imaging pro, uh, it's not sufficient. We're normally looking for some structures have such a brain to plasma or brain to blood ratio at least one to give us enough brain uptake in a very short term. So uh, still at Brook Heaven, they modify the structure, you now introduce uh, carbon 11 to different structures with different uh, groups. Uh, they show Mm, different uh, brain uptake, some very high, some are low, even with very sim similar structures. From here, we see these two, like we call H1021 or H103, has some brain uptake, but the specific activity, uh, binding is not good enough to move forward uh, for, for the study. So we kind of stop here for this kind of family uh, HDAC inhibitors. Then we try to test the hydroxymic acids. This is the uh, most commonly reported uh, uh, HDAC inhibitor. And the SAHA is FDA approved drug. So some people uh, try to label the SAHA with uh, F18 here. They use for uh, tumor imaging. You can see here, still no brain uptake. So what is similar structure, which someone uh, labeled at the other side of the molecules, and uh, they have uh, uptake in the body, but not in the brain. So next one, we try to label some drugs some uh, HDAC inhibitors in the clinical trial. Here are three uh, examples. Both are, uh, all of three compounds in phase one or phase two, and we label them with C11 to test their penetration of, uh, in the brain. So this is a uh, rats PET CT. You can see the skull inside the skull, there is no uptake for its tracers. We further test in the uh, uh, baboons. So the same thing from the PET MR, we didn't see any uptake here. And uh, after this, we summarize all of our data and think about how we find uh, a HDAC inhibitor can get in the board. So for all HDAC inhibitors, there uh, are uh, many three parts. This hydroxymase or benzamides is for zinc binding, which is necessary for HDAC binding. And we think about, because this one is a uh, hydrophobic, phallic uh, groups, we need some balance. We need a lipophilic group to balance the whole log D to make it brain penetrant. So we find, we check the literature and uh, found that uh, the mantle group may be a very good group to try. So we combine these two groups here and with a linker with a nitrogen, secondary I mean here, which can introduce a C11 easily. So we put all the three parts together. The binding of this compound to HDAC is very high. And uh, we label it with C11 and the, we test in the monkeys, uh, the brain and the body uptake are very good. So that means we may have good tracer here. And the chemistry is very simple. We, we, we make Martino stat and the precursor is very simple in two steps. And this uh, labeling is just uh, one step. 
the heat up with the methyl iodine in the solvent uh, get the uh, final product we need. Okay. So we further test the specific binding. So we have the baseline here. We do the collective modeling. We see the Vt value here is like from 40 to 60 in different brewing regions. If we treat with 0.5 microkig of the unlabeled material stat, we can see the dose dependent decrease of the Vt value. That, sh that sh shows us this specific binding. Mm. So besides the brain, we try the peripheral organs. First, we have the baseline in the, in the body. Then we use maternal state to pre-treat. From the TAC, you can see the baseline and the pre-treat curves are totally different. It a significant decrease the uptake in heart, spleen, kidney, and the pancreas. Then we try the SAHA, the FDA-approved h tag inhibitor. Uh, after SAHA infusion, we still see the similar trend. So the uptake of this, uh, uh, the tracer in the organs also decreased. That means maintenance that will be a good tracer with high uptake in the brain and major organs and with high radiochemical yield and high specific binding. So this is the uh, first one for our human brain PET imaging with maternal stats with PET and the MRR. We, we, uh, we got this image in 2014. And after that, until now, we have used maternal stats uh, imaged many patient groups. Uh, I'm leading the alcohol use disorder and uh, Parkinson's disease. So other PIs in the center or the hospital doing many other disease populations, uh, heart disease and uh, uh, AD and Huntington and bipolar depression, MS, and many kinds of uh, groups are undergoing right now. So I will stop here and uh, glad to take any questions. Hi, thank you. Uh, okay, and so next we have a uh, doctor Veronica Clavijo Jordan, uh, who's also faculty and she works on MR probe development. Uh, and so she's going to give us an overview of that now. Um, so, Veronica, if you can unmute your mic whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to take the lead. Yes, thank you. And um, let me know if you see my screen okay. Everything okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, um, well, thanks, thanks everybody, and one for inviting me and for attending this webinar. And I will introduce some um, a bit more practical examples and principles of molecular probe development for MRI. Now, I wish we were as advanced as PET probes, but so I won't um, have really beautiful human images of the probes that we're working on since we're still preclinical. But nevertheless, I'm excited to show you. Um, so I'm going to actually start with a clinical case that showcases the benefit that molecular MRI can have in disease detection and patient certification and also treatment planning. So this example here shows a normal human prostate uh, here on the left on a T2A MRI scan. And on the right is an abnormal T2A scan of a, uh, of a, a prostate of a 64-year-old man with a PSA of 6 um, that underwent multiparametric MRI, meaning that um, this patient received um, a gadolinium-based contrast agent, uh, diffusion-weighted MRI, T1, T2, and um, uh, with, with this multiparametric MRI, multiple lesions and, and foci um, regions here were identified. So as you can see here in the overlay, um, and also on the T2 scan, this, um, these overlay shows hyper-intense regions of presumably hypervascularity, potential lesions that could be malignant in the peripheral and transition zone. Um, unfortunately, so this, this patient actually opted for radical prostatectomy. So in this, with this um, um, uh, prostate, we can actually validate the imaging findings with histology. And as you can see here, so the, the lesions that were identified with MR, most of them were indeed um, low-grade cancer, but there were some lesions here 
that although they, they uh, showed hypervascular or hyper, as hyperintense in the MR, in histology it actually showed that it was more likely than not uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So one, you know, then begs to ask the question, so um, would these lesions uh, have remained indolent? Would the patient, would, have, would he uh, have underwent um, probably better prognosis, kept the prostate if um, there was active, active surveillance instead of radical prostatectomy? Additionally, what, um, what other techniques could we actually develop in order to differentiate between this benign growth um, from uh, actual malignant cancer? And this is where molecular MRI really comes to the rescue and helps us, can help us differentiate between these lesions. So now I'm gonna have you keep this in mind and I'll guide you towards how we would reach to a molecular probe that would allow us to differentiate that. And first I'm gonna now um, talk about, you know, what current approved agents are mostly used in the clinic. So most clinically approved agents are gadolinium based. Um, and that means that they have an um, gadolinium three plus ion that, are, that is um, encased or by, by either a microcycle uh, here meaning that it's a cage, a closed cage, or by a linear um, chelate here. Now, nowadays, in the past few years, macrocycles have been uh, more widely used um, because of some toxicity um, uh, uh, problems that linear agents uh, seem to be presenting. Um, other class of agents that are used uh, nowadays are also uh, nanoparticle based. So these nanoparticles are usually iron oxides that are coated with some um, uh, biocompatible polymer and uh, with some caveats of mainly, um, mainly stemming on the fact that they're larger. But all of these agents are really passive, meaning that they only report on either perfusion, accumulation, or reten and retention due to their size. So in order to um, detect the specific targets that inform on disease, uh, a probe needs to be then um, functionalized with some sort of targeting variety and, and, and thus need to be detectable at concentrations that are relevant for that target in vivo. So this is where designing molecular MRI probes then require this balance between optimizing, you know, stability, kinetic inertness, toxicity, target sensitivity, uh, functionalization, and, and what, I, what we can call the potency of the agent. So basic MRI, you know, principles. So um, approximately around 60, 65% of the total body weight of an adult is really water. So MRI takes advantage of this fact, of this abundance of water in the body, and is able to see water content in tissues in three dimensions. So it has really great soft tissue differentiation. Um, and specifically, it, um, what we're looking at is at the hydrogen protons in water. So when we apply a static magnetic field outside of it, these protons tend to align and process with a, with a frequency that is called the Larmor frequency that's unique to the um, uh, nuclei. And this precession um, movement then imparts this magnetic moment that tends, has a tendency of aligning with the external magnetic field. And this is where these basic principles of T1 relaxation and T2 relaxation come into play, which we manipulate constantly in order to create better contrast in an image. So, T1 relaxation is really the intrinsic rate to align uh, 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 with the uh, magnetic field and the longitudinal plane. Uh, the hydrogen protons are in constant thermal energy uh, in, in energy exchange with the surrounding ions. And so when the static field is applied, these protons align with the magnetic field in order to reach their minimum energy state. So this, this equilibrium state could be then perturbed, let's say with an RF um, external energy but then it, it, it will always have the tendency to align. And this rate of growth of this magnet, overall magnetization is what we call the longitudinal relaxation rate. So that, that constant is that rate. On the other hand, T2 relaxation actually is looking at the XY plane and it's looking at the loss of spin coherence. So if we then perturb these spins and we um, allow these, these um, the spins to be on the XY plane, and deface and um, lose the spin coherence. And that rate of uh, transverse magnetization will actually be uh, uh, dictated by the con time constant called the T2 relaxation rate. Now I'm 
I'm skipping many steps here in just the interest of um, uh, time, but um, one could then um, apply the block equations, solve them, and then reach to some expression such as this one where we have, this is the spin, um, spin echo signal equation where as you can see there, there's, there's, this would be the signal that you would have in an image, in an MRI image, proportional to the magnetization, but it is heavily weighted or it can be heavily manipulated depending on this T1 and T2 times. So if one uses an exogenous agent that can alter these T1s and T2 relaxation times, then one could in, indeed uh, promote uh, local, either hyperintensity or, or loss of signal. And this is really what paves the way uh, for the development of highly efficient contrast agents. So T1 shortening agents in this case, so agents that, that make the T1 shortening of water protons shorter um, are mainly paired with unpaired electrons. Uh, their dipolar interaction between un the unpaired electrons and the magnetic moment uh, and the mo electron moment and the proton moment are in constant exchange with the bulk water. And so this exchange of bulk water results in a reduction of T overall T1 of the, of the water. And this, the, the efficiency of, of how an agent reduces that T1 is called the relaxivity. And this is a term that's really important whenever we want to characterize how good of an agent um, uh, you know, molecule is. So how can we maximize this T1 relaxivity? Um, and, and we look at the Solomon, Bloomberg, and Morgan equations, or the SBM equations, we see that the contribution, the overall relativity is actually a contribution of multiple in, uh, sphere coordination spheres, in, relativity in each coordination sphere. So for example, the first coordination sphere or inner sphere is really the, the water bound, directly bound to the, to the gadolinium or to the metal center in this case. Um, so the distance is a lot smaller and much closer to it. The uh, second sphere is actually a, a farther away, weakly bound uh, water molecule to the ligand. So these, these two molecules in this, in this example are in constant exchange with the bulk water. So one can see that it, by, by following these equations, there are many parameters, but the main ones that we can manipulate are really the residence time. So how long does that water actually stay uh, bound to the to the gadolinium and uh, being trans and then uh, takes off to transfer that bulk to to the bulk water, uh, the rotational dynamics. So how fast does this molecule tumble? The number of water molecules coordinated with the center, the distance, the spin number, and the magnetic moment of the center. So that's for T one. Now T two and T two star agents are a little bit different, and the main. Um, you know, a class of them are really nanoparticles. So these are super paramagnetic um, nanoparticle agents that are mostly based of oxides. So iron oxide, for example, or um, D block transition metals. And what they actually, what they are, they're crystals in which there's a, there's a mixture between iron two and iron three. And those two magnetic moments actually align or couple antiferromagnetically and then um, and end up having a net magnetic moment. Um, so one can see, think of them as, as a small little magnet, permanent magnet. So if you apply a magnetic field, the bulk magnetic response is described as its magnetic susceptibility. So if a water molecule comes in contact with, with this, um, this, this a gradient field, then it, it, this would become exchanged with the bulk water and it would reduce the T2 uh, because of the susceptibility. Methods for um, now enhancing this, this relaxivity or this R2 effect, which is also the efficiency of the agent. So T1, T2 agents have this, this uh, metric called relaxivity, right? Um, for nanoparticles, really what we're looking at is enhancing or uh, maximizing the mass magnetization of the particle. And this can be done by doping, for example, the crystal in which now you, instead of having an iron two with iron three, you can have an iron two with a manganese ion or with a cobalt ion or with a nickel ion. And this, this in this case, for example, tunes the mass magnetization uh, quite nicely. Um, one disadvantage of nanoparticles really is the size. I mean, they, they tend to be large. So it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to deliver these to um, other parts of the body. 
uh, T T1 versus T2 shortening agents in this case. Now we need to think about which one would be better than the other. And what, what we see is that um, all across the board in this table, so at different fields, one can see that um, uh, T1 is really much longer than T2 all across the board. Um, so if we simulate that, we know that for the same relaxivity, um, T1 agents can detect much lower concentrations, meaning that it's, it, T1 agents really are, are a little bit more sensitive than T2 agents when it comes to detection. At the same time, we need to think about specifically, especially for particles, what is the R2 to R1 ratio? So both, uh, both parameters, so both uh, in properties are always present in contrast agents, right? And um, what, what, if you want to detect a, a, an agent with a T1 weighted scanner as a T1 agent, the lower the R2 to R1 ratio means that you will have a much larger window of detection. So you have a much lar uh, larger dynamic range to detect in vivo. So, you know, some considerations to think about are, well, what kind of targets are we looking to detect? Um, and this, these, depending on that answer, you need to think about the probe charge, the hydrophilicity or probicity, the size, the affinity to the probe, uh, to the target, um, also the affinity um, to binding to serum proteins. So all of these factors will actually dictate the fate of your probe. And examples of this are, for example, if the target is an intracellular marker, then the probe needs to be endocytosed and, and, and to enter the cell. So you need to design your, your ligand in such a way that it would allow to do so. Now, for example, if the target is in the brain, then, then you need to have a small hydrophilic um, uh, probe in order to actually go through the blood-brain barrier. Or if um, you know, the target is found in low concentrations, then you need to be make sure that you have enough potency or enough relaxivity to detect those. And, and certainly also the binding kinetics and, and, um, and uh, pharmacodynamics and kinetics need to be as, as studied as well. So now I'm going to go with how. So now that we've learned, you know, these, these different um, parameters that we need to think into, into a, take, take into account, um, how can we apply these concepts and actually do molecular imaging with MRI. And this is, I'm gonna start with an example of a probe that was, that's developed here at the Martinos by Eric Gale's group. And, um, and really what, he, what they did is they developed an iron-based probe that actually can image inflammation by tuning the oxidation state. And this probe actually, what it does is um, first, you know, inflammation is actually accompanied by an oxidizing microenvironment. And it, this is due to secretion of reactive oxygen species uh, that are act by, uh, secreted by activated neutrophils. So, you know, what, he, what they rationalized is we can have an iron two based probe, a diamagnetic, in diamagnetic form, that when it is in, in the presence of reactive oxygen species, then can turn into an iron three form and then turn on and change relaxivity. Now, what does this mean? If we look back at those equations, this means that this, this uh, change from iron two to iron three will actually modulate the paramagnetic moment and will also modulate the spin number. And in turn, that will modulate the, the, the ability to shorten T1. This can clearly be seen here in this image, this phantom image, where um, you know th this was done in, uh, uh, I believe, 4.7 Tesla MRI, and you have a water phantom with clearly no contrast or no enhancement on a T1 wave scan. The iron 2 compound, which should be in its low relaxivity and no contrast state, and clearly you, you don't see anything, and on an iron 3 um, state, uh, clearly you see that it, that that results in an increase in the image intensity. Now I've talked about relaxivity over and over, and you know, we measure that, that's a metric that we always measure in order to see how effective our contrast agent is. And you compare the iron two to the iron three, clearly the iron two is um, almost zero, uh, it's very low, so it's off state is very silent, which is great. Um, the on state, so in, its, in, in, its, um, in the presence of reactive oxygen species, you see that it increases 
um, uh, quite highly. So, and that is consistent across different magnetic fields. So that's, you know, great and in vitro. And, and in vivo, what we did is, um, so we said, okay, what, how can we promote um, inflammation in the pancreas? So we took animals, um, healthy animals, and gave them a regimen of cerulean and LPS, which promotes a really active and, and acute pancreatitis. And we delivered then our probe in its off state, and we see that um, the, say, the animals that were not induced pancreatitis do not show any enhancement in the pancreas. And the animals that did receive um, the treatment to promote pancreatitis show a really large enhancement in the pancreas. So clearly we have validated this histology and indeed, you know, this pancreas uh, was um, very inflamed by MPO and by CD11B. And the correlation of signal change in signal uh, contrast to nose ratio to the actual um, activity of this my myeloperoxidase, which is um, an inflammatory uh, enzyme, uh, correlates really nicely. So, so this is this was really great, uh, and it's a really nice uh, way to to showcase how really understanding and manipulating this magnetic param this uh, parameters of magnetism really um, of iron can give us. Um, such in, in, like pleasant information in vivo. Now I want you to remember what I um, showed in the first slide, and it was how can we differentiate, you know, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia from prostate cancer? We have this problem where most men over over sixty uh, will have BPH, so will have an enlarged prostate. And at the same time, they may have prostate cancer. So these are very, very uh, two very confounding conditions. And we see that you know, with the current MRI techniques, that are that actually it is it is a, a very heavily MRI-based diagnostic um, uh, disease. Um, we see that there are still regions of the prostate where it's very difficult to differentiate. So, you know, with molecular MRI, what we do is we think of a target, a target that could be specific enough to differentiate between these, these different conditions. And one that we, that, that we found that was, that's very, uh, that works very nicely is actually zinc content in the prostate or in the gland. And interesting, interestingly, the zinc levels in the prostate gland is actually the highest levels of zinc in the whole body, in the male. And uh, it has really high levels in the normal healthy gland and um, uh, uh, almost a little bit higher levels in the BPH prostate and almost no, no, um, no levels, uh, or not no, but much reduced levels of zinc in the malignant prostate. So um, we take advantage then of, uh, of this, you know, discrepancies or of these differences. And what we did is, is we designed a small molecule, in this case, gadolinium based, an agent that could actually detect specifically zinc, bind to it, and then promote a change in its magnetic properties to change the, the T1 of the surrounding water protons. And what we did is, is you, we designed this agent that when it binds to zinc, it actually forms a ternary complex, a larger molecule with albumin. Albumin is found everywhere in the body. And what this does is, is when before, before binding, the agent would actually tumble very slowly. Now with binding, oh, very fast, I'm sorry, binding with albumin, now you reduce the molecular tumbling and that results in, again, manipulating the parameters in these equations. So the molecular tumbling is a term right here, tau r, which is the rotational correlation time. And that also in turn affects the exchange rate or the water residency time, and then um, ends up affecting this entire term, therefore reducing the T1 of what surrounding water protons. So now this switch, what it does is it changes from a low relaxivity um, probe here which when it's not bound, it has a 4.7 relaxivity at 0.5 Tesla. And when it forms this large macromolecule binding to zinc, it increases almost threefold. So now we have a, an agent that 
much like the other iron agent in the presence of its target or of, of, of the um, interest, in the marker of interest, it actually changes relaxivity, so it forms like a switch. Now, as I mentioned, you know, with the considerations that we need to take into account is what, you know, we, we need to look at the target and where is this target located? In this case, zinc is actually located in intracellular stores and our probe does not penetrate um, cell membranes. So rather than modifying the probe to enter the cell, we decided to make the, the, the target available to the probe. And we did this by uh, promoting the natural secretion of the gland, so the natural secretion of zinc, um, by, a, by an increase of blood glucose. And we tested this in cells and we, we were able to see that secretion, but then we also did it in vivo. And we see that um, if we take fasted mice and we give them glucose um, IP, and then we also give them uh, this gadolinium-based sensor IV, only the animals that received glucose um, uh, showcase a prostate that is very enhanced in all the lobes. While if we don't give glucose or if we apply other contraceptives that are not zinc targeted, the prostate does not enhance. So as, you know, as I uh, showed earlier, being able to detect prostate cancer is really the goal. And what we did here you know, is, is to, um, we obtained a transgenic mouse of, that develops progressive stages of disease. And what we saw is um, that when they're young, um, the prostate looks um, healthy and uh, the, there's clearly enough zinc to be secreted, showing here as a really high intense um, gland. However, as the disease progresses, you're able to see that there are little lesions that start to form, but these are only very obviously detected after the, pr the probe is, and glucose has been ad administered. And clearly when there's a large uh, uh, tumor, you don't see anything because there's definitely less zinc. So we validate you know, the same way with histology and we see that the, the, the prostate, the healthy prostate that does not show any sort of hypointense regions with MR is actually healthy, which is what, what, what makes sense. And this lesions that presumably indicate that has lost its zinc, um, we confirmed that, that those, those lesions were actually malignant. So, so this means that this probe can then specifically detect prostate cancer and differentiate from you know, uh, healthy and benign conditions. So you know, these, these are very examples of the most, the most traditional and conventional probes. There exist many, many much more exotic probes for sure, um, but I, I thought I would have given an overview of the very conventional ones that are used. And although uh, there aren't really that many uh, MRI, molecular MRI probes that are um, being approved at all, um, this, the, the gadolinium sensor for zinc in the prostate is actually in the pathway of, of getting an IND um, for um, hopefully a first thing human. But it is, it's, it's a really long road of going from mice, rats, dogs, primates, and um, hopefully we'll get there. So to summarize and to conclude, um, so this is really what I, I thought of, of would encompass the MR probe development cycle. You know, you think of a target, you identify the target, and you characterize that target. You know, what's the abundance? What is it intracellular? What, is it informative of disease? And then um, move along the cycle with, you know, what are the required probe character characteristics then to be able to detect it? What sort of biophysical parameters can we tune? And then we test in vitro, test in vivo, validate all our results, and then evaluate whether we need to modify or continue the cycle, and then, um, you know, go into different animal models look at toxicity, and, um, and then hopefully go into first thing human. And um, with that, I will thank you and take any questions. Mm -hmm.